Welcome, everyone. I am delighted to be speaking with Professor Emily Kaspar. She is Associate Professor of Social and Cognitive Neuroscience at Ghent University in Belgium. And her research is concerned with moral and social behavior, with methods that really go beyond conventional academic boundaries. She has conducted research uh, with military personnel, prison inmates, uh, and survivors and perpetrators of genocide. And she has done work, for example, field work in Rwanda and Cambodia. She also collaborates with NGOs and non-academic institutions. Uh, you have received a lot of awards and recognitions. I'll just mention uh, two or three. So since October 2022, she has received and elected, uh, she has been an elected member of the Collegium of the Royal Academy of Belgium. Uh, in August this year, uh, she has, uh, she was noted as one of the top 15 scientific young talents by the Dutch New Scientist magazine. And uh, she recently received the Early Career Award from Society for Social Neuroscience. And that was this month. And I think next year you'll go to Japan to deliver the, the, the lecture for that. Okay. So it's a pleasure to be speaking with you, Professor Kaspar. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for the invitation. My pleasure. So let's begin with the questions. First, I wanted to ask you about what initially started your interest in neuroscience and uh, how that interest, the passion has changed, has evolved over the course of your career. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's a great question. I think uh, my interest in neuroscience developed back when I was uh, in college. Uh, I had a professor who mentioned some very interested neuro interesting neuropsychological cases, uh, such as ME negligence, and I became directly interested in the brain. Like, how is that possible? Uh, how does it work? And actually, I was hesitating a lot with physics, especially astrophysics. Um, because I also have a huge interest in space overall. Uh, but yeah, I decided to go for neuroscience and then I started my study in psychology at the university. Uh, but I was it was clear for, for me that I just wanted to do neuroscientific research and that I wanted to, 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 to have a career in academia. What I'm doing right now, uh, the populations I'm working, is, uh, I'm working with, um, it's indeed slightly more recent, uh, but not that recent, because I also had a huge interest in, interest in forensic sciences, criminology, and uh, criminal behaviors overall. And uh, I always knew that I wanted to, to work uh, with population or in, in such settings. Uh, but this was not something very developed over the course of my uh, university studies, like uh, forensic neuroscience or stuff like that that didn't exist. And so what I did is that uh, during my PhD program, I also did a two years, uh, two year certificate in uh, forensic science and forensic psychiatry mm -hmm. to be more interested in this, and uh, it allowed me to just keep on going with like. Actually, my, my actual field of research has emerged from uh, some criminal cases that I followed when I was studying uh, this back in time. Wow. When you say followed, you mean followed as um, like a general citizen that you were interested in, you were hearing about? I see. I see. Wow. Yeah. So anything that is challenging uh, requires extra motivation. And I think to say the least, you're... Your field of, I mean, the, your approach to research is, is challenging and unconventional, especially doing field work. Mm -hmm. um, so, what I wanted to hear what motivated you to take on this challenge, leave the mm -hmm. comfort of doing laboratory. Even laboratory research is challenging, but to do it in the in in the real real world setting is even more challenging. And I remember like doing an, something like an e. ERP study or EEG study, we need people to stay motionless. So that <laughs> is kind of an indication of how much control we need to have over uh, yeah. the situation of research. So again, the, the challenge and then the motivation to to break that convention. Yeah, um, I actually, I, I remember the moment where I decided to go for the first time in Rwanda or the first time I initiated the, the, the studies with prisons or the military. 
But it's true that it was not something I considered at first, because, I mean, when you study neuroscience, most of the work you read about or what you learn in school or with your colleagues is classic neuroscience research in the comfort of the lab. And I mean, yeah, there are some studies with patients that are very difficult, but you do not really learn to just go beyond and to reach other populations. And I think this evolved uh, for two reasons. The first one is that I don't like steak just in my office. <laughs> I mean, I work in academia, so of course I'm, I spend most of my time in front of my computer, but I have a deep desire of adventure overall. I, I don't like to stay static somewhere. So I think that helped also in the process. Mm -hmm. And actually this emerged uh, by um, interactions or meetings I had with actors from the societal world uh, instead of the, the pure academic world. So for instance, um, a couple of years ago, I was a postdoctoral researcher at the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience. And um, so I was working on obedience to authority and, uh, and topics like that. And I, I, I received a huge media coverage from media from all over the world. And at some point, uh, the director of an NGO, which is uh, uh, Radio La Benevolencia, which is located in Amsterdam, uh, read about uh, one of those interviews uh, with me and read about like my aim, uh, my very uh, humanist values and, uh, and, and, and what I would like to do in research. And he actually contacted me and offered me an appointment. And actually his NGO is uh, active uh, in Rwanda, Burundi, but also in Congo. And they try to create interventions to uh, to help people resist call to violence. Mm -hmm. And so he mentioned uh, Rwanda and actually contacted me because they are trying to test their intervention with scientific methods, which is not that common actually from uh, to, to have these requirements from an NGO. So it was very great. And uh, he mentioned Rwanda, the history. And I don't know, I was already working on topics uh, related to obedience to authority and Genocides are frequently referred to as crimes of obedience because this is possible when a huge part of the population accepts to, to, to take part in this or not to revolt against uh, the government leading the genocide. And yeah, he mentioned Rwanda and I don't know, I started thinking about it. I was like, yeah, why not doing my research in Rwanda mm -hmm. uh, in a context where a genocide truly happens? Mm -hmm. And then I have a sort of a black box that, um, so I, I remember that I said, oh, Randa would be cool. And then I, I, I don't remember why in my mind I consider it was a good idea. Um, I don't know, I just decided to go to Randa uh, with my portable um, EEG uh, to, to mm -hmm. start doing research there. And that's how it initiated. Of course, it took time, right? It was really not easy to implement and that I can explain a bit more how we implement this project mm -hmm. but yeah, I think it emerged from this and then yeah I actually realized by then that it's not because we do neuroscience that we have to stay stick in our western worlds I mean we have portative materials we can just travel everywhere and do EEG studies or near studies <laughs> So at that point did you have a contact person in Rwanda or you went there and then you decided to find no, no, I, I tried to find someone before because okay. actually the, the first crucial step is to know if they have uh, an ethics committee. Uh, I mean, most countries have ethics committees, but not all of them and not necessarily for research that are not medical. So actually the way you initiate a project in those countries is exactly the same as you would do in Europe or in North America, mm -hmm. you just you first have to ask for an ethics approval. And I actually realized that they had an ethics committee, but it was mandatory for, for me to find a local collaborator, which also makes sense because I mean, they know the country, they're, they're, they know their culture, the sensitivity of the country. And so I first spent one year to try to have a contact uh, person in Rwanda mm -hmm. to then being able to initiate the project. Right, okay. I wanted to add a quick footnote on what you said about being adventurous. I think uh, that also is related to being creative. I remember reading your 
your work on sense of agency and hierarchies in re in relationships, power relationships. And I really felt like this is creative. You were, you were at that point, it was, I think those were papers published in 2018. I think you're, they, they were your doctoral work or based on your doctoral work. Um, and I, it was, you were at that point, you were within the lab situation, but even there you were injecting your adventurous spirit and creativity into the paradigm, existing paradigms. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted yeah. to take note of that. Um, adventure and creativity, yeah. I think, go hand in hand. Yeah, I think also something helps is that I'm slightly, perhaps it's an euphemism, but I'm slightly hyperactive. And I I have a hard time just focusing on something that is repetitive, for instance. And for me, when I consider a research question, for instance, I like to just start from scratch, like, okay, I don't care about what the literature has done. I mean, it's not that I don't care, of course, at the theoretical level, but in terms of methods, I have my idea that is of interest. And here I had questions about how hierarchies diffuse responsibility, for instance, regarding the mechanism. Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, let's just start from the beginning. I ignore what has been done in terms of methods. And then I try to, to implement my own methods. And then I will go in the literature to see if it fits, if it can cali be calibrated based on the, the actual literature. And I just love to create new things and to, to try to go beyond uh, what has been done already. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. We can talk a lot more about that. Um, but for now, I also wanted to ask you about interdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm. Any institution that I've worked at, they, there's this, uh, we can call it lip service to like talking about the value of being interdisciplinary. And that way of Talking about it, it's like everybody is doing their comfortable work con in, according to the conventions of what is classical and then trying to reach each other and becoming interdisciplinary and work together. But I feel like the way you approach research, you go, as you said, you find real agents in society. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you can't escape being interdisciplinary. So I, I wanted to ask you about your impression about what it means to do interdisciplinary uh, research. I think your work brings together sociology, law, psychology, neuroscience. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm a neuroscientist, neuroscientist by training, and the brain remains my main interest uh, in terms of research. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, I mean, especially in the topics I'm working on, I mean, I, I cannot consider that based on studies, even though it's field studies, I could know, I could elaborate on real life genocides, for instance, if I just also don't use another approach. I mean, the lab approach or the field lab approach is of course very relevant because you can manipulate variables, you can control the environments to really try to understand the mechanism. But I, I think this is just not sufficient to stay in a lab to understand human behavior. I mean, you have to talk to other humans, you have to, to, to take other perspectives to understand them. And that's also why I started, for instance, to do qualitative work. Uh, I am doing neuroscientific work with uh, my experiments, but I'm also doing qualitative works with uh, interviews with the perpetrators in Rwanda or in Cambodia to try to understand what they have to say. And of course it has its own limitations as well. So, so does neuroscience. But I think it's only when you, you try to approach interdisciplinarity that you can really have a global understanding of what you're doing. And on the top of it, if you can add societal actors who truly work with them and who have a totally different perspective than the one you can have in academia, then, of course, it's impossible to fully understand what happened in the mind of people, for instance, who committed atrocities during the genocide because we were not there at that moment. But I, I would not feel comfortable in drawing any conclusions on how the brain works if I also didn't, had, didn't have the insights coming from other disciplines, coming from societal actors, for instance. So most of the time when I try to initiate a project with a specific population, I mean here, not university students, which are who are quite, quite classic, I just prefer to first talk to the person who are interested in this, like NGOs, for instance, they know perfectly the problematics, they know perfectly, and 
Yeah, I think it's only when I have their input that I understand, okay, what I'm doing, why am I doing it, that then I can develop research and try to understand the research question. Mm -hmm. I understand what, what you mean by that. To, um, but let's make it a little bit more clear for our audience because and what you're talking about is really about the meaning of a piece of research finding. If it's really, if you're looking at it in a completely isolated way, out of context, we, in a sense, we have too much freedom to interpret it in a way that it, ser that it serves our theoretical interests. Mm -hmm. But what you're describing is an awareness of what goes on around it. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to ignore that awareness, especially if you are, let's say, in an isolated laboratory situation. Does that mm -hmm. agree with what you said, what you, what you meant? Yeah, no, exa exactly. I think I, I really like that when I'm doing something, I see a broader scope. Uh, it can be theoretical, it can be societal, whatever, but I need to understand why I'm doing this. And I, I like to have like, like a very huge number of insights coming from different people be it in academia or outside just to understand more globally what we're doing and to adapt to 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 have this general interest in the research question mm -hmm. so let's turn to some of your uh, some of your actual work and findings so your lab uh, your lab your your research focuses on I mean, your mobile and portable lab it focuses on uh, neural basis of moral and immoral behaviors I was wondering if you could talk to us about some of the, you know, in an overview way, about some of the unexpected findings or expected or significant findings that, uh, significant, not in a statistical sense, but in a, <laughs> in a societally important sense uh, that you have yeah. found so far. Yeah, so it's pretty large because in the lab, we're actually like working on very different topics. Uh, so I have some people working in prison regarding the impact of uh, prison on the human brain. Uh, I have some people working on uh, intergroup biases. Uh, I have some people working on uh, the mechanism related to obedience or disobedience. So it, it's quite broad. I will just take two examples like this. And I think uh, for the first one, I will go back to my initial studies on obedience to authority. Because when I started investigating this question, I was at uh, University College London in the lab of Patrick Hargard, who is a worldwide expert on volition and agency. And when we decided to, to, to evaluate or to, to investigate if uh, obeying orders would alter the sense of agency, for instance, um, I truly believed that it would not influence it as much. Uh, in the sense that, I mean, of course, uh, we know the theory, we know that uh, agency can be um, uh, can be reduced when uh, uh, your, your, your choices are not free or stuff like that. But mm -hmm. when people obey an order, they're always the authors of their own action. I mean, that's them deciding, yeah, they receive the order, but then they can decide when to press, if they will execute the order or not. There is no TMS over their motor cortex. So I was not sure that actually the sense of agency would be impacted. And um, actually, I was I, I was wrong because uh, we did observe actually that uh, the sense of agency was reduced when people were obeying orders. And actually, this results has been replicated many, many times by now. So it seems quite uh, robust. And... Actually, that study surprised me for many reasons, because when we developed the paradigm, so just to, to recap a bit, the paradigm is about one person having two options. One option is to inflict real harm, uh, a real electric shocks to another person in front of them in exchange of five cents. Uh, and uh, another uh, option, which is uh, not sending the pain, but not earning the extra money. Mm -hmm. And actually, when uh, we designed the task, I was absolutely sure that no one would ever send a painful shock to the person in front of them for five cents. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a ridiculously small amount of money. Yeah. And, and in addition, that first study was done in a classic university students. So most of them, they heard about Milgram or I mean, perhaps they do not know the name Milgram, but 
they just know that there was a study assessing obedience with electric shocks. So I thought that yeah, no one would deliver shocks. And in addition, they are all going to disobey and I will never be able to test my hypothesis. And I was also very wrong because actually people administer quite a lot of shocks uh, to the person in front of them to earn even just one euro, but administering, for instance, 20 real shocks to the other person. And it's very hard to make people disobey in a lab context. I mean, that's probably my biggest challenge ever in this field because, yeah, even if the pain is real and they see it, it's very hard to make them disobey when they come for an experiment. And it's problematic because if you want to study disobedience, but no one disobeys, <laughs> then you have kind of a, a problem at the experimental level. Right, right. So, yeah, that was yeah, some of my <laughs> main unexpected um, results. I have others on other topics, but <laughs> you let me know uh, about sure, that. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's really great. That's uh, I love that. Um, with regard to the re reduction of the sense of agency, did you find that? Because um, I remember it's a while ago, but I remember that sense of agency was reduced not just on the actor's side, but it was also reduced on the person giving the order. So in a sense, it just, to some extent, it e seems to evaporate from the situation. Yeah, indeed. So this is something that you have observed in subsequent studies that we realized afterwards, because I mean, our idea is that, yeah, okay, if those obeying orders have a reduction of agency, but, but the, potentially leading to a, a reduction of responsibility, of the feeling of responsibility, then who in a hierarchical chain may experience this agency or responsibility over the action outcomes? And so in another set of studies, we indeed started to investigate those giving orders. And we did that uh, about sense of agency, but we also did it in MRI scanners, targeting empathy for the victim's pain or the interpersonal feeling of guilt. And what we have observed actually is that it seems that in a hierarchical chain, agency, empathy, feeling of guilt, and I mean here with implicit measurements and neuro uh, imaging methods, it seems that it's vanished for, or at least reduced for for the different elements of the of the chain. Mm -hmm. So it 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 somehow highlights the power of hierarchical situations uh, mm -hmm. to, to manipulate or to change human behavior. Right, right, and power in the sense that maybe it it uh, uh, removes some of our weaknesses with respect to some actions, like the weakness of having empathy, strong empathy, mm -hmm. if we yeah. call, if we label that, and uh, so that. Mm -hmm takes me to my next question. I wanted to ask you about that intersection of your interests and your research on these, these human capacities, including not just agency, but also empathy and responsibility. Uh, how is it that you're approaching all these together? And um, what is the kind of, I mean, research paradigm, or the kind of relationship that you'd like to establish between them? Yeah, so actually, um... My approach is that, so, um, yeah, of course, I, I studied mostly the sense of agency during my PhD, but it's not that I'm studying the process itself uh, to then uh, see what can influence it, is that I start with a task that is behavioral, and I try to target different neurocognitive processes to see how this task can influence this mechanism that then influence behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so even though I started on agency and the feeling of responsibility, I'm now more and more interested in additional processes like empathy, guilt, theory of mind, cognitive conflict, motivations. So I try to multiply the number of make potential candidates uh, for a mechanistic approach uh, that I have. Uh, in order to try to understand the, the phenomenon, which is for me, the behavior itself. I see, I see. So converge on the, on the, on the phenomenon mm -hmm. by uh, going through different mechanisms. Yeah. Um, now, you're, you've been covered, your research and your work has been covered in media, as you said, since a few years ago, starting a few years ago. Uh, has there been any misunderstandings or simplifications of your work, things that you urge people, including myself, because I'm what I'm doing now is a kind of like journalism, <laughs> but in a smaller scale. Uh, are there mis simplifications that you like people to avoid or 
ha have happened before already? Yeah, so <laughs> the media is a good one because, um, I mean, I've met plenty of very serious journalists where they ask questions, but they, they want to be sure, for instance, they, they check with me that what they say or what they write is correct. But um, yeah, I also have some bad journalistic experiences where, for instance, they even do not ask me anything. They just read a paper and they try to take what appears to be a very a good title for having more clicks on their media. And the thing is that I'm working with very sensitive populations, very sensitive topics. I mean, when we work about genocide perpetrators, reconciliation in Rwanda, or inmates in prisons, that's very easy for, for the media to, to create wrong links or to, to just title uh, wrongly what I did have observed and how to interpret it. So most of the time, I, I try to control as much as I can. So I do press release versions. I urge everyone to first send me uh, like uh, the text before uh, approving it. it. It's not something that I can fully control, of course, because once a paper is like put in an open uh, access, then yeah, anyone can have access to it and spread it uh, the way they want. But yeah, we really try to do this. And in my lab, a lot of PhD students and postdocs are also following workshops on communications because some journalists really put pressure on you to, to make you say something that you do not want to say because it's not true, but it's hard to resist the pressure. And we are not trained for this. I mean, we are academics. Uh, we come from universities. We are not trained to resist the social pressure that some journalists can put on us to make us tell things. And yeah, it, it happens from time to time. So with experience, no, I mean, it's easier and easier, but yeah, the, 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 the media coverage is it's something quite hard actually uh, to, to control over these topics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's an excellent point you, you brought up. Uh, we are not trained for, to, to resist amplifying communication, mm -hmm. exaggerating it. And in fact, I would say maybe you you might disagree with this, but when we were trained, when we when we are trained in academia, in, to some degree, we are trained to do some of that marketing for our research, some of that yeah. sales salesman, salesperson's um, attitude mm -hmm. of my research is important, but it that becomes a vulnerability when it becomes because the media journalism has takes that to a whole di different level, mm -hmm. uh, and the um, so. Maybe we can pay attention a little bit to, especially with research that is media um, appropriate or interesting mm -hmm. to a wider public, to do a little bit of non-marketing, anti-marketing or counter-marketing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, no, d definitely. Um, I mean, we also have in academia kind of a pressure in the sense that, yeah, it's better for our CV, for whatever, if... I mean, the world knows what we are doing. So for many academics being in the media or having receiving a media coverage is like something exceptional because mm -hmm. it does not. So there is it's not easy to, to resist the willingness to be in the media and the, the way they want to oversimplify, because we also have to, of course, to be in the media. We also have to oversimplify what we do. Of course, we cannot, uh, we, we have to adapt uh, what we say. And it's very difficult to, to, to adapt it by respecting what we have observed in the results, even though we simplify it. And yeah, I, I think it's, it, yeah, it's, as I mentioned, it's not a training that we are used to have. And we have this implicit pressure to 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 be famous <laughs> just yes. I, I quote it. yeah and at the same time we have to be very careful especially depending on the topic or the population so i mean this is something i had to learn actually like directly from yeah whatever i didn't expect to have such media coverage when i was doing my phd i mean that was exceptional it was bbc new york times and stuff like that and i was like yeah my english was not super developed <laughs> and i was like it's just a first study. I do not master the topic at all. And yeah, it's, I had to I learn. Mean, no, I understand. It's part of that interdisciplinary training. 
in yeah, exactly. now you're like you you become an expert in media studies too and uh, maybe more there's more um a risk in uh, doing influential research because your work might become a resource for some political agenda too yes and um so that's that's a whole different topic we don't have to get into that but no, no, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss about it because that's indeed something I'm facing uh, regularly. I mean, for instance, what we do in prison regarding um, like, yeah, how the prison impacts the brain and what can be done to prevent this to happen to 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 perhaps prevent some recidivism uh, mm -hmm. when inmates exit prison. Um, this is in that sense reg relatively easy because everyone wants to somehow improve the life of inmates and it's very clear the purpose i mean no one I, I think no one would try to worsen it and but for instance for the work i'm doing uh, on obedience and disobedience it's more tricky because there is a high risk of misuse so my aim is very humanistic what i want to do is when we know more about the mechanism that help people resisting immoral orders then perhaps you can create interventions to help people saying no and to prevent mass atrocities. I mean, that's a very general aim, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a high risk of miscues. What if I find it, it's unlikely to happen, but what if I find something, a very specific brain regions, let's say that is associated with like, like a switch button mm -hmm. <laughs> to make people obey or disobey. I mean, it's very unlikely, but there is a risk. And what if some governments use this uh, for bad reasons uh, mm -hmm. to, to create even more obedient soldiers or whatever? So actually, the risk of misuse is there. So that's also why I have to be extra careful on anything. And with some grants I have, I have to spend months thinking about risk of misuse, how to reduce them and stuff like that. That's wow. also something I had to learn because, I mean, again, from my neuroscience perspective, that was not something I was ever trained uh, for before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. My... Um... I want to ask you, maybe not last, but uh, one of the questions. Looking forward, uh, what are some of your, what the things that preoccupy you uh, regarding future? I mean, you don't have to disclose any of the ongoing research, but also maybe we can include that your pedagogical aims, like your your aim as a teacher and supervisor, the mm -hmm. things that you like to you envision and you would like to accomplish. Yeah. So I think one of my main aim at the moment is, I mean, I start to be more and more uncomfortable with the idea that we draw conclusions on the human brain while targeting such a small portion of humanity. And actually, when I initiated this field research, I have been refused many grants because some people said that doing research in Rwanda in neuroscience would just be not impossible that uh, I raised deep, deep concern about feasibility and I think this has to change and I think we, we in neuroscience overall we just need to be more global in the way we approach humanity and not to be restricted on the samples so one of, of the thing I'm trying to do now so when I'm teaching but also uh, to, to spread it is to really show how all this is possible. That's also why I created a blog, for instance, where I explain all the steps that we do to conduct research in Cambodia, in prisons or whatever, because I, I want to show that yes, it is feasible. And yes, we can just do it like any other classical studies. So for me, that's one of my general aim. It's not specifically topic related, but it's more like, as a general future for neuroscience, I think this is a very crucial step. We mm -hmm. always have talks about increasing diversity in academics, uh, in neuroscience, and that I fully agree with, but I think we also have to target diver diversity in our samples and the populations we recruit. So that is one of my main, um, my main focus at the moment. And the other thing is that I realize more and more that, yeah, I'm doing fundamental work, of course, but I'm also doing more societal work or work that can has an impact. And actually, I I think for me, it's very important to have the two. And I the way I want to direct a bit more uh, my research in the future is to continue with the fundamental work, but also to be able to have grants that are 
perhaps at first not fully dedicated to research, but that can use research or what, what we do in neuroscience to, to have new novel interventions uh, on different topics, for instance. So really use my knowledge to try to have fundings that can have a more direct impact on any problematics in the society. Almost like uh, the, the path to advocacy through research, uh, yeah. including advocacy for paying attention to culture. Because yes. uh, I remember in my in my own training in uh, cognitive neuroscience, there was no attention to culture because everything was fixed. We were in one setting and we were pursuing a research and it seemed as if culture was irrelevant, but mm -hmm. it wasn't, it was just fixed. It was only like, there was no variability in it. But as, mm -hmm. you, as you're uh, arguing, if we include multiplicity of cultures, it, culture itself becomes visible. It becomes one of the factors that are at play. And we can see not only its presence, but also its possible effects. Yeah, no, definitely. And I actually, it's it's very hard um, now to, to conduct research with these populations because like beyond like the technical difficulties of doing field research and, and to, to be confronted to, to these populations, um, there is also the problem of the fact that for instance, we like if no one else is doing what we are doing as well, we feel a bit isolated. So if some people can replicate what we're doing or to make predictions, like we have to make predictions on effects based on uh, the findings in the, the Western world, while we target a totally different population with a totally different perspectives. And it's even weird at the theoretical level to make such assumptions that yeah we make predictions based on one part of the population to extrapolate what would happen in another totally different population mm -hmm. so yeah I, I really hope that more and more people will engage into it i remember it was quite funny because one day um it was uh for a paper uh, for a study that i had conducted in rwanda so first note finding reviewers is always a mess we take it takes months for us to find reviewers on what we are doing because we are alone so it doesn't help so everything is slower but i remember that one reviewer told me oh yeah good study but hardly replicable like if it was my fault yeah <laughs> No one else was doing it. And I, I would be very happy that other people also try to engage in such practice and try to replicate the work or go beyond or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, I was I found it quite funny that it was kind of a major criticism over my work that no one else is doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, from their perspective, I mean, it's it, that seems a little bit like if something is hard to come by, if it's like a precious metal, because it's rare, so we should dismiss it. In fact, it's the opposite that should be our response. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I wanted to just, yeah, I wanted to end with a simple, maybe a little bit selfish question, but did you ever consider philosophy as one of the disciplines that you are engaged with? And does it come up uh, for you or for people around you as like something that maybe is an, an annoying perspective, like um, philosophical? <laughs> So annoying, definitely not. I think it's very important to also have a global understanding. Um, it's true that on my own side, I'm not that much, I do not have much of a feeling of, uh, of philosophers, uh, just because I prefer field work compared to more theoretical work, but that is mm -hmm. part of my nature. But uh, I'm, I'm very happy to talk uh, with philosophers about what they think of all this and how they can even have a, a more global understanding or even deeper theoretical understanding of what we are doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Philosophy, as you said, is also quite conventionalized and there's classical like the forms of philosophy that don't want to engage with uh, the realities of society. But I mm -hmm. think there is that pioneering possibility to be pioneers just as you are in neuroscience in other fields. So hopefully uh, your career would be inspiring not only to people in neuroscience, but also in neighboring disciplines. Hopefully. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we will see. Well, hopefully uh, we, uh, we will talk again and I will uh, ask for, for updates regarding how <laughs> things are going. 
Thank you so mm-hmm. much, uh, Professor Gaspar, for your time, for mm-hmm. uh, answering my questions and looking forward to speaking with you in the future. Yeah, thank you very much for the, the invitation. That was very great. Uh, great yeah, thank great. you very much.